from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Day. Coming up on Ag Day, finally captured. People ask you how you catch an alligator, just barely is the answer, because it's usually just barely. An alligator on the loose, not in Florida, but in Chicago. Cleanup still going on from the spring floods. The trouble we have on some of these areas is the ground is dry, but the roads are impassable. As temperatures take a dangerous turn. Ag Day, presented by the all new Chevy Silverado, the strongest, most advanced Silverado ever. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths. A large portion of the country dealing with high heat and it's about to get even hotter with another day of sticky weather ahead and temperatures soaring close to 100 degrees through the weekend. Taking a look at Thursday's cattle heat stress map from USDA. Now this is for Friday. You can see that large chunk of red under the emergency declaration on the map extending all the way from Texas into the plains of Midwest. And the news not much better on Saturday with the heat pushing into the East Coast. For cattle not used to conditions like this, producers are having to take extra precautionary measures to ensure their safety. Meteorologist Mike Hoffman joining us now. Mike, people need to not just be concerned about their livestock, but themselves in this heat. Yeah, this is an excessive heat situation. There's a warning in many parts of the Midwest all the way to the East Coast for that from the National Weather Service. Here's what our latest uh, feels like or heat index in this case uh, map is showing us by middle to late afternoon. We're talking triple digit heat index values from eastern Colorado all the way to the East Coast. That is a huge area. Some places will hit 110 or higher, uh, but I think most are probably going to be 100 to 105. Now, even by the time we get to tomorrow morning, we're looking at heat index values in the mid to upper 80s, so it really doesn't cool down tonight. The models usually back off on the second day, but I would suggest the same idea from Kansas City to the East Coast during the day tomorrow. He, uh, the drought monitor, not a big issue, obviously, but the latest root zone moisture, which uh, Cindy just showed you yesterday, has uh, backed off on how much uh, moisture there is in the ground. And when you get into heat like this, that can start to be a problem in some areas drying out. We'll have more in weather. All right, thanks, Mike. And doesn't this look like a cool spot on a hot day? Cities like Milwaukee opening up city buildings and other places as cooling centers. The National Weather Service estimating more than 100 heat records will fall by Saturday. Most will not be due to the scorching daily highs, but for the lack of cooling at night, something called nighttime lows. So those lows will be record high. Besides heat, many producers still dealing with water woes lingering from the flooding earlier this year. Ag Day's Betsy Jibben joins us from the Ag Day newsroom. Betsy, the damage still evident. Clinton, we are gathering pictures in some of the problem areas like Rockport, Missouri and across the state lines into Iowa where standing water is still present. Here are some of the pictures from McPaul, Iowa and the Hamburg, Iowa area. Two areas hit hard by multiple rounds of flooding. And as you can see, there are still busted bins standing. Farmers saying some of the ground in the county is dry, but the roads are still closed. One producer telling us farmers are still trying to plant a cover crop on prevent plant acres in order to receive a payment from the market facilitation program. A payment amount USDA still has yet to release. This farmer says any amount of rain could change that plan. Uh, we're trying to get busy as quick as we can to be able to get cover crop planted. That's probably the biggest issue we have right now is, is just trying to manage what we have out here. Uh, it's not going easy, it's gonna be time consuming, but we're going to work and, and starting to get some things done. Jorgensen telling us he's days away from planting a cover crop and hopes it doesn't rain. He also says farmers in these disaster areas are strapped for cash and hope these MFP payments will be enough. And flooding still an issue further south in places like western Tennessee. Tennessee's Governor Bill Lee taking an aerial tour of flooded cropland and promising support to farmers still struggling with what to plant. Lee flew over Lauderdale and Dyer counties, and while that area is used to flooding, officials say this year it's rare to see waterlogged fields go into July. Farmers say they have been wrestling with flooded fields since October. Agriculture officials there say up to 30% of the counties are experiencing flooding. Those wet conditions from the spring continuing to cause problems into the growing season. American Farm Bureau Federation saying corn and soybean crops appear to be in the worst condition they've been at this time of year since the drought of 2012. 
The most recent crop progress report from USDA reporting 58% of the corn crop was in good excellent condition, while just 54% of the soybean crop was rated the same. An AFBF economist saying, quote, with so much uncertainty, especially for corn, it's no wonder farmers with storage are holding tight onto the old crop and anticipating higher prices later in the year, end quote. On the trade front, U.S. negotiators spending time on the phone with their counterparts in China Thursday. U.S. Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin in France for the G7 meeting of finance ministers. Mnuchin saying he and U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer had a call scheduled Thursday, adding that this is the second conversation they've had and there's been conversations at the staff levels. He signaled that in-person talks are still possible depending on how the conversation goes. He said the U.S. is trying to get back to making a quote a lot of progress in those talks. The EPA is releasing its annual report on air quality, and according to the latest numbers, air quality continues to improve. The report looks at trends through 2018. Agency says emissions of all key air pollutants dropped between 2016 and 18. Now, looking back even further, between 1970 and 2018, the combined emissions of six key pollutants dropped by 74% while the U.S. economy grew 275%. Now overall, particulate matter like dust and ash fell in the last couple of years. However, in some places, there were increases in the concentrations of particulate matter in the outdoor air, much of that due to natural events like wildfires. The USDA's plan to relocate its Economic Research Service to Kansas City is continuing to make waves in Washington. The USDA says 145 employees of ERS and the National Institute of Food and Agriculture have accepted the relocation. So far, that's about 37% of those eligible. The subject, a hot topic at the Senate Agriculture Committee hearing on Thursday. The administration's haphazard decision to relocate two critically important research institutions the Economic Research Service and the National Institute of Food and Agriculture will affect real people who rely on the USDA services and hamper its capacity to support farmers, families, and rural communities for years to come. I assure you that we will seek uh, more opportunity to expand the reach and the influence of ERS through the use of considerable cost savings from this move. Uh, that is our goal. Our intention is to make this and our desire to make this and the recognition is to make this an opportunity for us to allow this agency to grow and to be sustainable in the long term. A permanent building is still being sought for the agency in Kansas City. Until that time, all employees who are relocating must report to work in whatever office space the agency gets by September 30th. Up next, farm lending is on the rise. We'll take a look at the latest numbers from the Kansas City Federal Reserve. And later, the battle against corn rootworm is an important one. We'll hear from a K-State agronomist about new techniques in winning the war. Closed captioning is brought to you by BASF. Grow smart with BASF. We create chemistry. We're seeing more increases in farm lending. That's according to a new report from the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City. The numbers found in the Agricultural Finance Data Book. The volume of loans increasing 11% compared with last year. That's the fastest pace of growth in the second quarter since 2011. Operating loans continue to make up the majority of non-real estate farm lending. It increased more than 16%. And according to the data, the volume of new non-real estate loan originations at commercial banks totaled more than $800 million in the second quarter. And for the seventh time in the past eight months, the rural Main Street index is remaining above growth neutral. It now stands at 50.2, down from 53.2. The bankers reporting about one in 10 farm operating loans from last year were not repaid and rolled into this year's loans. USDA only reporting light soybean export sales of new and old crop this past week. No major purchases by China. The news coming in on the low end of trade estimates. We have an update now on what that did to markets on Thursday from the CME. We saw some pressure come into the market after really failing to get out above technical resistance, both for live cattle and feeder cattle. And we've raised some caution flags in our nightly wrap up that we send out to clients talking about the inability to rally on halfway decent news. For the live cattle, we've seen cash stabilize for the most part over the last week, week and a half, but weren't able to get out above technical resistance. As far as the feeder cattle are concerned, the same type of deal. We've seen a big break in the corn market about 30 cents since last week, and we cannot get this market to really rally 
significantly. Down today, 140 is a big pivot point for us. A break and close below here really, I think, opens the door for a potential retest of 135. Wrapping things up with the lean hog market. Lean hogs have been kind of a head scratcher here over the past couple of months. And I think we're finally coming close to maybe putting in a near term bottom. It's been all over slope with blue line futures from the floor of the CME. Soybeans feeling a little pressure as of late. So what exactly do we know about this crop? Ty Morgan asked a question in today's analysis from our studios in Kansas City. Here now with Brian Doherty of Stuart Peterson. And Brian, when USDA released the latest July crop production and WASD reports, uh, we saw a, a reduction in soybean carryout. Was that anticipated or do you think that's just a sign of so many unknowns when it comes to soybeans right now? Yeah, it's a sign of so many unknowns. Uh, reduced acres, but we don't know what the prevent acres will be on beans. Farmers are still trying to plant beans. Uh, I talked to one farmer this week. He's, he's on his third go around in southern Indiana because of rain. These are not double crop beans, by the way. <laughs> so farmers trying to get double crop beans in. So there's a lot of uncertainty, and, and yet the U.S. has ample carryout inventory. The world has ample Im inventory in the ASF, the South African Swine Fever. That's all a concern. Yet but what sometimes people forget is that, that the carryout number basically sets the tone for a price. And beans between eight and nine bucks, it's pretty cheap beans when you look historically the last decade. In fact, they're as cheap as they've been in a decade. So it's the, it's the projected vision of where that carryout number, if it gets bigger or smaller. So the market really doesn't care so much uh, about the price. It's just if carryout, even though it's big, gets smaller, usually you're going to see an inverse relationship and prices move higher. And that's why beans have been supported this spring is all this uncertainty and the, the prospect that carryout may still be large, but it's narrowing inward. Well, and there's so much more, more uncertainty. I mean, usually we say soybeans, the production-wise, we really depend on August weather. But this year, this soybean crop is just so immature. You know, it's more like September weather that's, that's going to matter. When you look at these weekly crop ratings in the 50s in the good and excellent category at mid-July, that's, that's, that should be alarming. Now, it doesn't necessarily guarantee we'll have a shortfall. Beans have surprised people. But the growth in beans have been, uh, I think, almost startling. I took a 250-mile drive through my home state and in in, in around that area and was really surprised at the, at the almost stunted crop that yeah. existed. Yeah. Right. Real quick, though, with so many issues with demand on soybeans, do you think supply can trump soybean demand this year? Well, I think July, August weather could create the supply that trumps demand. I do. Because we've got this large residual. We don't have anything with China figured out. We may get some purchases out of there, but we're still going to, in the end, have this big supply. And if we just look south, South America has big inventory. So that, that's, our, that's our wet rag over the market is, is the supply side. All right. Brian Doherty, Stuart Peterson, thank you so much. We need to take a quick break, and then we'll have much more right here on Ag Day. To discuss marketing strategies, call 800-334-9779 or visit stuartpeterson.com. Join Andrew McRae for Farming the Countryside, a farmer-focused podcast that is all about production agriculture. Farming the Countryside is available wherever you listen to your favorite podcast and is brought to you by Nutrien Ag Solutions, the world's largest provider of crop inputs and services. Welcome back to Ag Day. Meteorologist Mike Hoffman here looking at the weather map. And Mike, we keep talking about this heat, and it looks like that high pressure is just going to build in here for the weekend. <laughs> yeah, it really is. Uh, it, basically, everything south of that uh, east-west front you see across the northern tier of states is hot for this time of the year. And I know it's summer, it's supposed to be hot, but this is excessive heat, basically from the Continental Divide eastward anyway. It uh, obviously is still, it's always hot, very hot in the desert southwest, but it's a drier heat than the farther east. But I don't care, 110 is 110, no matter which way you cut it. But high pressure definitely pumping in the moisture from the Gulf of Mexico, keeping the heat everywhere south of that front. Over time, over the next couple of days, we will see this frontal system, especially the western end of it, start to slowly sag southward, and that will be the end of this heat wave. So for most folks, it's two to three, at most four days, before this starts to abate a little bit. As you can see, by tomorrow morning, there'll be some showers and thunderstorms, mainly along and to the north of this front, it looks like, but it's just hot. 
uh, south of it, heading through the rest of the day Saturday, basically mid Mississippi Valley into the Ohio Valley, lower Great Lakes. This is heat like you only see every few years, not unprecedented, obviously, but nonetheless, it is uh, it is way up there as far as the heat index values are concerned. There's late tomorrow. There'll be some thunderstorms starting to form along that cold front there. Precipitation estimate past 24 hours. We've seen some hit and miss through the Great Lakes in the southeast. Fairly good area yesterday in the uh, Great Lakes anyway, and then you, we've added a little bit more with some more thunderstorms in that area over the next 36 hours. The heat continues, obviously, as we've been talking about. You can see low temperatures tonight only in the 80s in a large area southwest of Chicago all the way to Dallas. High temperatures uh, during the afternoon tomorrow well into the mid 90s <clears throat> once again across most of that area. It is starting to cool off though in the West Central Plains. There's the feels like temperature or the heat index. And again, this afternoon we're going into the uh, 100 to 110 range in many parts of the Midwest. And so we will continue with that ridge for a little while. There's Saturday. Uh oh, there comes the trough digs in big time change for everybody in the Mississippi Valley eastward for most of next week. And it looks like another trough's going to dig in to keep it there as we head into next weekend. That's a look across the country. Now let's take a look at some local forecasts. Heading to Walla Walla, Washington, comfortable with lots of sunshine, high of 79 degrees. Houston, Texas, obviously hot and humid with sunshine, high of 94. And Portsmouth, Ohio, hazy sunshine, very hot and humid, high 95. Up next, some agronomic advice in the battle against corn rootworm. And later, not sure how this dude survived the polar vortex, but we'll meet Chicago's very own gator. The IBM Watson Decision Platform for Agriculture, helping to feed a hungry world with the power of AI. Rootworm can be a big problem when it comes to corn. A Kansas State entomologist is looking into what alternatives producers can use to keep them out of their crops. We are looking at testing new insecticides for the control of the western corn rootworm. This is one of the most serious pests of corn here in Kansas and throughout the corn growing region. Historically, it's been referred to as the billion dollar bug. The corn that we're growing out here, this has been in continuous corn production for about 17 years. So we do have a lot of corn rootworm pressure out here. And when we planted this corn earlier in the season, we treated at planting time with an infro insecticide. And now we're going through to see how well they controlled the corn rootworm larva um, when they were feeding on the roots. So we will be going through and digging these plants, hauling them out of the field, taking them and washing the root systems off so that we can clearly see the damage that was caused by the larval feeding. So here is an example of some corn rootworm damage caused by the larval feeding. And you can see this plant has, we call it goosenecked, where the larval feeding has destroyed the root system. One of the best ways to still eliminate this pest is to rotate. So move to soybeans or a different crop for one season. The corn rootworm larvae can only feed on corn roots um, and they only survive one year. However, in the last five years or so, we've seen increasing resistance of the larva to the BT hybrids. So they're not killing the larva as well anymore. Um, so we're having to go back and develop new and better ways to control the rootworm um, again, which is what we're doing out here is, is looking for uh, good alternative controls that will still be effective at controlling co corn rootworm larva in continuous corn fields. All right. Well, it's not a Chicago dog or one of the Wrigley Field cubbies. There's a new animal turning heads in town. Up next, we'll meet Chance the Snapper. We'll find out how this lost alligator was captured. Closed captioning is brought to you by BASF. Grow smart with BASF. We create chemistry. Not something you would expect to see in a Chicago public lagoon, an alligator, but there it was and it eluded Chicago authorities for a week. That is until earlier this week when the reptile who gained the name Chance the Snapper was finally captured. And now we're getting our first up close look at him. The five foot three inch long gator didn't seem too bothered by the cameras. The gator couldn't do any snapping because its mouth was bound shut. He was held by the man who captured him, Frank Robb. He's an alligator expert from Florida. He talked about how he caught the gator with a fishing pole. Vocalized, uh, saw his eye shine, and caught him on the fishing rod, and uh, 
it went down pretty fast once we finally saw him. We, I think we had taken eight loops around the, the uh, lagoon and surrounding areas before we finally saw him. Uh, but once we were able to see him, uh, it was one cast and one cast and done. No one really knows how Chance wound up in the lagoon. We're told he will be taken to a wildlife sanctuary or a zoo to live out his days. There you have it. That's all the time we have this morning. We're sure glad you tuned in. It's been part of your day with us from all of us here at Ag Day. I'm Clinton Griffiths. Have a great day.